Welcome back to Understanding Python. My name is Jake, and today I'll be covering iterators and iterables. You've already seen iterables being used and created in various forms in this series. However, today we are going to dig deeper into truly understanding how they work. So let's get started. Now the first iterable that comes to mind in Python are lists. So let's create a basic list. This will just have the values 1 through 5. And if we load this file in IPython, we see we have our basic list. And now we can also check its attributes. So we'll call the dir method on basic list. And in here we can see we have a dunder iter method. This is the method that's called when you enter things like for loops is what returns the iterator object itself that then gives you a new value each time you go around that for loop. So the main difference between iterables and iterators is that iterables are objects that can return an iterator, while iterators are objects that define the behavior for getting values from iterables. Now we can call this dunder iter method directly on basic list. So basic list dot dunder iter and we see we get a new object back. A shorthand for this is just to call the iter method on basic list, which does the exact same thing. So let's add that to our file. Basic iter is equal to iter on basic list. We'll save that and reload the file. Now we have our basic iter object. And if we check out the type on this, we see that it's a list iterator, which is different than the type on basic list, which as you'd expect is a list. And this list iterator has a new method, and that is dunder next. This is the magic method that defines the behavior for getting a new value out of the list. And just like we called the dunder iter method on our basic list, you can also call that method directly against basic iter. So let's try that. Basic iter dot dunder next. And you don't pass in any values to it. And we see we get one. And much like dunder iter, we also have that shorthand next. And we'll call that on basic iter. And we have two. Continue on three, four, five, and if we run this one more time, we get a stop iteration error. This stop iteration exception is how your for loops know when to stop. Otherwise, they just continue on forever. Now, what would happen if we try to call next on our basic list? Let's try it. We see the list object is not an iterator. So iterators work by maintaining state. As demonstrated above, we see that each time we called next on our basic iterator, it returned the next value in that list. It didn't return the entire list, and it didn't go backwards. So it knows where in the sequence it's at each time this next method is called. And just as importantly, it also knows when you're at the end of the sequence and can return that stop iteration exception. Now this might not be immediately transparent, so let's make a new class so we can better see these concepts in action. This class will be called random letters. Now there's only three methods that we need to define within this class. And for our init, it's going to accept a single argument of count, which we're going to set to a default of 10. So this will be the maximum amount of items returned during the iteration process. And we'll save that to a local variable called count. Now the next thing we need to define is our dunder iter method. This is going to take no arguments. We're going to initialize a local variable called i, which is going to store the current iteration number. We'll start with zero. And then simply, we return ourself as this class is both the iterator 
and the iter of bool. Now to make things a little bit more clear, let's go ahead and add a print statement up here. And this is just simply going to say, dunder iter called. So whenever this dunder iter method is used, we're going to see this statement print out. And then finally, we're going to make the dunder next method. Again, this just accepts self, no other arguments. We're going to do the same print statement, saying dunder next called. Now what we'll do is we'll add one to self.i to let us know that we moved one value further in our iteration. And then for our return, we're going to need to import two more things. That is going to be random and then from string import ASCII lowercase. So you may already be familiar with the random module. What this does is it provides a number of methods that can help us to make pseudo random data. And what I mean by pseudo random is that with most things with computers, it's never really truly random, but it gives the appearance of randomness. And then from the string module, we're going to import ASCII lowercase which is the lowercase English alphabet from A to Z. And then to get one random letter from that, we'll call random.choice on ASCII lowercase. If we did this in a for loop right now, it would run forever. And before I explain why, let's see what that looks like. Okay, give ourselves a bit of room. We now have our random letters class. So we'll say, for L in random letters, we're going to print L. And here we see we're getting a bunch of next calls and it's just continuing to run indefinitely. We'll control C that to stop it. Now, why is this happening? Well, if you remember from before, the way our for loop knew how to exit the iteration was because it saw the stop iteration exception. So this is where our count logic is going to come into. We're going to start up here. If self.i is less than self.count, then we can do these. So we'll bring this underneath the indentation and then make an else down here. If it's not less than self.count, so if we are above our max number, then we're simply going to raise a stop iteration exception. So if we go back into this, and we do that same for loop that we did before, we now see it stops. And interestingly enough, you see at the very top here, iter is called. That's because when it first entered this for loop, it called the iter method. And then from there, as it went through the values of the loop, we see next is called, we get our first letter. Next is called, we get our second letter. Next is called, third letter, so on and so forth, until it reaches the end. We see next is called again. So it reaches this line. It checks to see if self.i is less than self.count. It wasn't at the time. So we got the stop iteration error and our for loop handled that perfectly, exiting. And just in case you're curious, this is what ASCII lowercase looks like. It's simply a string, A to Z, all lowercase. So that's a little tip if you want to make random data for yourself. Now, if you watched my video on generators, you might be thinking that this behavior seems similar, and that's because it is. Technically, all generators follow the iterator protocol, but not all iterators are generators. Something like this behavior is more easily defined as a generator. So why would you choose defining your own iterator instead of just defining a generator? Well, iterators in this form provide a little bit more control, especially if you want to work with more complex data or if you want to do more complex state management. So as a new example, I'm going to go ahead and define a new class. I'll write it out and bring you in to explain everything once I'm finished.
All right, now we have a random points class. This accepts a lower bound, an upper bound, and a count. The lower bound will be the lowest value for a point. The upper bound will be the highest value for a point. And count, of course, is going to have the same behavior as the class before. Our iter method is exactly the same. And our next method is similar. The difference being that now we are returning two values instead of a single value. To see how this is used, let's reload the file. And then we can do a for loop for x, comma, y in random points. We'll stick with the default values. Then we're going to print an f string using new f string mechanics in 3.8. So we're going to say x equals, comma, y equals. Now this time we don't have those print statements letting you know when you're entering the iter or when you're entering the next, but you can always refer to that up above. We're going to enter the iter as soon as we enter this for loop, and then each time that we go through the loop, it's going to call next. So let's run this. And here you see we have our x, y values. So this is an example of a slightly more complex iterator. Really, the possibilities with this are nearly limitless. You could create iterators that go through lists of files, giving you back information from each file, or whatever you can think up. Really try to get creative with an iterator. And if you come up with something really interesting, let me know down in the comments. Well, that wraps up this video. Now that you understand iterators, if you need more control than what generators can provide, try making your own iterator class. As always, today's code will be added to the understanding GitHub repo, so check the description for a link. And of course, if you have any questions or suggestions for topics you'd like me to cover, leave a comment for me. To keep up with this series, please consider subscribing. Thanks for watching.